Welcome to this episode of Unraveling Adoption, an intentional space to delve into adoption's complexities together. I'm Beth Syverson. I'm an adoptive mom of a curious and deeply feeling 20-year-old son, Joey. I'm walking beside him while working on my own personal growth and healing. I'm also a certified coach helping primarily adoptive parents. Joey and I are committed to helping anyone impacted by adoption, and we want to help the general public understand adoption's complexities better too. So listeners, when's the last time you thought critically about what messages we give our children, adopted or not, through children's picture books? Today's guest is Allison Olson, who brings insight as both an adoptee and an adoptive parent, and she has written several children's books about adoption. Her goal is to change the adoption narrative from the lucky child, that lucky word, oh lordy, to the loved child. Her books are called Surrounded by Love, an Open Adoption Story, which also has an activity book. She also has Love Letters to My Child, a keepsake journal. And this is the one that I find fascinating. It's called Learning About My Friend's Adoption. So we are excited to have you on Unraveling Adoption, Allison. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Beth. Yeah. So you're an adoptee and an adoptive parent. So let's hear about your own adoption story first. Just tell us whatever parts of it you'd like to share. Yes. So I was born in 1979 and adopted shortly thereafter. In fact, I was a baby born call to my parents. Oh, Like they weren't ready or waiting on it? They were waiting. So my older brother is adopted as well. And then I'm going to answer this before you ask, because everyone asks us, no, we are not (laughs) biologically uh, related, uh, but very much he is my brother. And he is a year and a half older than me. Okay. And back in the 70s, adoption was very different. The wait time was between five and seven years Mm -hmm, in the Midwest and the fact of two adopted children was a very extreme thing back then. So they thought they would age out because they had an age cap back then. And so they had to wait. I can't remember the wait time, right? I think it was like a year after my brother had been placed with them. And then they put their name back in the hat okay. and then they were only on the wait list for six months wow. and they got the phone call. So they were not expecting it. In fact, one of my favorite stories that my mom had is that they went to the adoption agency back then. They wouldn't give you the news over the phone. So they had to come into the adoption agency. <gasps> they were on oh vacation and they said, you have to fly back. You have to meet a new social worker. Oh my like, God. Okay. It seems like a lot of work, but they flew back to meet this new social Ooh. worker And the new social worker told them that there's a baby girl that has just been born in this hospital and she's ready to be picked up. Oh my gosh. And so, yeah, right, right then. So my mom said, hold on, let me call my dad. So my grandfather (laughs) called him and said, go buy a crib because my brother was only a year and a half, right? Still in the crib. You needed another crib. You needed another crib. So he went and bought a crib, put it together really quickly for my arrival home. So my adoption, my typical adoption terms are domestic, infant, adoption through an agency, right? Private adoption through an agency um, and closed is the biggest word um, associated with my adoption. And then I have two daughters myself, the oldest one, biological, she is nine, and our youngest is adopted, she's three and a half. And her adoption terms, some of them are similar to mine, uh, domestic infant adoption through an agency, so that means it's private. But the biggest difference is that her adoption is open and my adoption is closed. So the open has been kind of trending for the last couple of decades after you yep. in the 90s. In the 90s. Yeah, it's they started yeah. testing it out and then it really ramped up in the 2000s. Yeah. And now it's really that's the way they are marketed is open now. It's kind of hard to get a closed one. Yep. 90 plus percent of adoptions are open. Most agencies won't even write a closed adoption because of all of the psychological studies that they have done on adoptees and the benefits of openness. But I will give your listeners just a quick definition because people get very confused on what means closed versus open. Mm -hmm. So first of all, sometimes people think it's this light switch. 
right? Closed, open. Mm -hmm. I think about it as a dimmer switch. So off means off, closed means closed, but then open, there's a whole spectrum, but it's all open. So that's also why the term semi-open is weird to me because I'm like, you're just picking a random Mm -hmm. spot on a scale. But what it means to have a closed adoption, it means that my records are legally sealed by the courts. So growing up and even as an adult, I still hear this untruth being said around that when an adoptee turns 18, 18, they get access to the records. This is not true. No, this is not true. So I am 45 years old, professional and a taxpayer, and I do not have rights to my original yeah. information. And what is this information? What makes it closed? Literally names on a birth certificate, okay. getting access to the names. So now that you know that it's names of birth family and specifically birth mother, right? Because sometimes the birth father is not on the certificate. Mm -hmm. And so just having names. So once you know that, you know that any adoption from foster care is open okay? because they obviously know the names, right? So, and that's a big chunk of adoption right there. So that's closed, which is very, very different because I see sometimes in adoptive parent forums where they're saying like, oh, our open adoption went closed. We haven't heard from the birth mom and a mom. That that is not true. Mm. You can no longer take away the name people know about. (laughs) <laughs> you know, yeah, the birth yeah. family. So that just means the relationship isn't as strong as it was, right? The dimmer yep. switches further down than, than higher up. So open can range from just having that name mm-hmm. and not knowing them, not meeting them a person, not knowing much else, mm-hmm. all the way to the spectrum of they live down the street, <laughs> hanging out all the time, birth grandparents are watching them on the weekends, mm-hmm. and then anywhere in between okay. as a relationship ebbs and flows anyway. So that's the major difference. And so for our daughter and her birth family, we love them dearly and we view them as just an extension of our mm-hmm. own family. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like families built with step parents or step siblings. It's just like we're just expanding the definition of family, opening it up. More relationships equals more love and sometimes a lot more complications. (laughs) (laughs) More relationships to navigate. But that happens anytime. And just to clarify, the 90% open is domestic, I believe, because almost all international adoptions are going to be closed. Yeah, I'm focusing on domestic. Yep. Yeah. But even there, they are starting to change it more and more. Starting, yeah. mm-hmm. And they're also lessening quite a bit. That's There's correct. very few international adoptions at this point, which is probably for the best. A lot of borders have been closing. Yep. Yes. Okay. So this openness is great when it's really used and when all involved are really working hard to stay in communication and What did you notice when you adopted your child? Mm -hmm. What got pulled up for you as an adoptee? I'm sure that was interesting, especially since you had a biological child already. And then now you're in the world of adoption all over again. How did that feel for you? That is an excellent question. So I will say there were some surprises that were good, some surprises that I was like, whoa, (laughs) I'm I'm Mm -hmm. shocked about this. So some of the positive ones were how much they had learned psychologically from these different studies and what all as a family that was going through the home study and going through the education and all of that to get approved to be a waiting family, what all we needed to go through. It made me comforted as an adoptee, Mm -hmm. you know, federal background checks, (laughs) like Mm -hmm. we had to have the local police also write something up for us. We had to get physicals. We went through 40 plus hours of attachment specific training, like all of this stuff. Right. And our agency was wonderful about, we had two separate agencies Mm -hmm. because we live in Oregon and our agency did not do home study here. So, so we had two separate, but both were wonderful in their own right. But our agency, they started off saying we only do open adoption. And this is how little we as an adoption community educate outside of our community. As an adoptee, I didn't even know. I was like, what? What is this? I'm like, this is the best. This is what I needed. This is what we need, you know? You wish you would have had that. And Mm. so I thought, wow, the progress and the attachment training all of that, even down to, I like to tell people so they have a frame of reference of how much work it is to get approved for adoption. We even had to have a letter for our cat from our veterinarian. Whoa. That's correct. Oh my to gosh. say this cat is acceptable 
to be around a child. Okay. It's not going to kill a child. That's right. Scratch it to death. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So really extreme stuff. So I felt like, okay, I feel good about this. And I liked that the birth mom has all of the power and picks the families. Mm -hmm. And I liked all of that. Okay. So then we were selected and we had the nursery ready to go. And we're, you know, well aware of that there's a chance that she could decide to parent. Change her mind. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and just to be clear, she's a wonderful parent. So if she had made that choice, it would have been wonderful. Okay. So I was having this moment sitting in the nursery and I had bought all of the highly recommended adoption books for children at mm-hmm. the time. I literally had scoured Google for everyone's different top lists, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. And I bought them and I had this pile and I was sitting in the rocking chair and I was like, okay, I'm going to have this moment with my child that's not even born yet. It's not even in our house. Mm-hmm. And I started reading the first book and I'm like, oh, Oh my goodness. Oh no. And I threw that one on the floor. The other ones I gently placed on the floor, but that's how cringeworthy the first one was. Oh, what was cringeworthy about it? What did it trigger in you? Oh, that is an excellent question. Well, so first I will tell you as an adoptee, I can read a book and tell you if it's written by an adoptee, written by an adoptive parent or written by somebody who's just a famous author and someone told him to write about adoption and they know nothing about it. Yep. And this oh, is boy. one where they knew nothing about adoption. <gasps> okay. And it's a very famous author. I do like his other works. I'm not going to say <laughs> his name or okay. the title, but you will know if you're in the world of adoption. Every spread of the book was like this. You open mm-hmm. it and one page says, you needed a home. The other page, we were there to give you a home. Uh, Cringe. Uh, Flip the page. Mm. You had tears other page. We were there to wipe away your tears. So if anyone is listening to me and does not understand why that is cringeworthy to an adoptee, Mm -hmm. it is adoptive saviorism at its best. It is telling that young child, you alone are not worthy. We had to be there to save you. And to me, that is not the actual story for an adoptee. Even if they're being adopted from foster care, that is not the story for them. So going with our daughter, the true story, the way that I saw it for her was if she had stayed with her birth mom, she would have been loved, massively loved by all of her birth family. If she had gone with any of the other hundreds of waiting adoptive families, Mm -hmm. she would have been loved. And with us, she would have been loved. So I'm like, why is that not the story? Mm -hmm. Why is that not the story? But I'm like, okay, that's just the first book. Got a bad one. (laughs) Go to the next one. And then I would say this was more of the theme of several of them where I felt they were unbalanced is the way I describe them. Okay. And that tended to be, I could tell they were written by adoptive parents. And so okay. this one, and people are going to be like, I know exactly what you're talking about. It's two bears. It's a mama bear. And she's reading to her baby bear in a rocking chair. Mm-hmm. And so I'm not going to okay. say the book, but there's this want, again, not using the right word. And she wanted this child and this want grew and it grew and it grew. Right. And so I'm just sitting there feeling this love from the adoptive parent side. And then I flip the page and then she starts talking about the birth mom. And it's struggle, 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 struggle. Mm -hmm. And I, as an adult adoptee, had never, until I got to the end of that book, felt so abandoned before in my entire life. So I want to make sure these parents that are reading this cute little bear book understand. And again, I... (laughs) I'm a pretty healthy person. You know, it just was like, oh my goodness. And what I realized was you can make any story look like that and feel like that when you're imbalanced. And what I mean by that is Mm -hmm. coming to adoption, everyone has struggle Mm -hmm. and love. Yes. And so why are we not only talking about the love from the adoptive parents, not the struggle? We had infertility, all these struggles Mm -hmm. to get here. No, Mm -hmm. you only talked about the love. The birth mom Mm -hmm. had so much love. She investigated all of the different Mm -hmm. adoption agencies. They don't just make one phone call and then adoption works. It's like all of this interactions with the adoption agency to make sure this is happening, make sure this is the right decision that she wants to do. And all of that work if there wasn't love. 
And of course there's struggles. So to me, I didn't like that it was imbalanced. Mm -hmm. And yeah. in children's books, they usually just focus on the positive and the love. So the thing I always like to compare is like books about farms. They're like happy. They talk about the farm animals. Look at the pigs and the cows and, you know, and the horses. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They do not talk about that. It is grueling, tough work. And the blizzards and the... Yeah, 12 yeah. to 14 hours for these farmers yes. to do all this stuff, right? Uh, Going back to that moment, though, of when I was sitting in the chair, I realized I have to write a book. Okay. I don't have the time. I don't have all these things. But I'm not going to read these books to my daughter. I'm not going to do that to her. Yeah. I owe it to her birth mom to have a birth mom illustrated in a book mm. and look beautiful, not look disheveled and struggling and like give her yes, the yes. the due she deserves, right? Yeah, dignity. Yeah, yeah. If any of us were in a book, if any of us were in a movie, it would be a beautiful representation of us. That is what she deserves. Yeah. And so that's why I wrote Surrounded by Love, my first book. That was your first one. Mm -hmm. And that was my big focus on it was to make sure that the birth mom was evenly represented uh -huh. the same amount of times as the adoptive parents in the book. Uh -huh. Very good. Yeah. That's lovely. And then one of the things I just want to share with you the little Easter egg on this one uh -huh. that I only tell in podcasts. Okay. So my illustrator's brother was adoptive. Okay. So she understood. So she understood the complexities and sensitivities. Mm -hmm. So I would say things like put relief in the face, not necessarily happiness, Okay. different things like that. And she was able to convey through her amazing art, the emotions that I was wanting to show in yeah. the book. But the thing that she did that I didn't even ask her to do that I love is that every character has a color. Oh. The birth moms represent in pink, the adoptive moms represent in yellow, the adoptive fathers represent in blue. And if you look at okay. the young adoptee, she always has a bit of color from each of them oh. to show the important impact they all have on her life as she yeah. grows up. Oh, that gave me shivers. Oh, that's so beautiful. <laughs> you fixed it. <laughs> I'm so proud of you for doing that. Like a lot of people say, yeah, I'm going to write a book. Well, you actually did it. And that's not your only one. And I, I, I'm thinking about you, you know, in that rocking chair before your child was even there, how triggered you got as a healthy mm -hmm. adult adoptee that's probably done some work. Imagine what your two or three or four or five year old child who has no tools, has no concepts of any of this. I can't even imagine how that must hit them. These big concepts of being abandoned and your birth mother struggled, incapable. And, oh and my God. nobody wants to hear that when your life started, when you were like inside the womb, that somebody was struggling, like at that young of an age, well, when it's yeah. age appropriate and they understand that. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine explaining to a young child like that? Just a simple thing, like two different people can both have jobs and one person's job pays for their rent and their groceries, et cetera. Uh -huh. And this other person's does not cover that. Mm -hmm. That is beyond, I don't even know if my nine-year-old fully could yeah. comprehend How that. To so know? then you try to take that down to a toddler where you're just explaining where'd you come from. Yeah. And it's these deep things where you're trying to over-explain a situation that honestly, as an adoptive parent, we have not been in. Right. Right. So if you're going to write about something around the birth mom, just go to a birth mom written book. Like, do you know <laughs> You know what yeah. I'm saying? Go talk to somebody or yeah, and, have a birth mom look at it. Or, yeah, you know, there, I mean, there is. So like Raquel McLeod, she's a birth mom. She's written a book. Go with that book, you know? So, so yeah. that's where my issues led, yeah. where the common theme in a lot of them was that mm -hmm. it was this unbalanced. There was the lucky theme that was kind of like woven mm -hmm. in, whether it was a big theme or a small theme throughout. And I just wanted it to be you came to this world, there was a lot of love. Yes. There was a lot of love that surrounded you that you weren't aware of. Mm -hmm. There was love before you were born. And so every time I show 
And again, I showed both sides. So it starts with adoptive parents and it shows them wanting a child, dreaming about a child. Mm -hmm. And then they make the decision around adoption. Mm -hmm. And I simplify that because it's a children's book. So I have a scene where they look up at the night sky and then the stars outline the baby. And then I do the same thing. The same type of scene Uh, when the birth mom is making the tough decision around adoption with the same words. She wished on shooting stars. She meditated and she prayed. And it says prayed. It's not a necessarily um, religious book. It's just more Uh, of made a deep decision, right? A big decision. It wasn't like, oh, let me just do this right now. Yeah. it, It gives kids an idea that both sides really put a lot of energy really into this. put a lot of energy in this and then I made sure whenever there were the pregnant illustrations that there were hearts Aww. that she was lovingly looking down and holding mm. her belly and then I put the phrase this is when you know an adoptee wrote it she loved you even when you were tiny in her belly mm. and I will even read this sometimes too I did a panel a couple months ago for an adoption agency that adopts from foster care. Okay. And someone was trying to say, well, our situation is different because addiction, blah, blah, blah. And I said, it does not change this. It does not change the statement. They did not want this child to be taken away from them. They loved this child. So it does not matter the situations, the struggles, This is an important statement for self-confidence, self-esteem that I just wanted adoptees to grow up in here. And I especially wanted my daughter to hear. Oh, that's so beautiful. Well, you put so much thought into that and really intentionality and there needs to be more books written by adoptees. That's for sure. Agreed. (laughs) Agreed. Tell me about the book, Learning About My Friend's Adoption, because I've never heard of a book like that, that addresses adoption from that angle. Yes. So it's intended for kids that are not adopted. What we would call non-adoptees. They don't even know that's what they're called, right? That's right. Yeah. That is how much we have focused on education inside this bubble of our adoption community. We all try to stay on top of the latest adoption language. Mm -hmm. Even just folks listening to this podcast, you are trying to learn, right? You, you are somehow touched by adoption. You are trying to learn. Let me tell you, your mailman's not doing that. The person at the gas station's not doing that. The grocery store clerk is not doing that. Teachers. Teacher. Oh goodness. Yes. Teachers who should librarians etc. I would go so far as to say as an adoptee and adoptive parent that the education level outside of our community is straight up the 1950s. Yeah. I get the craziest things said to me. And when I tell people, they're like, can't believe it. And then you find another adoptee or adoptive parent and they're like, oh yes, get that all the time. Right. Uh, You know, as an adoptee, heaven forbid you ever say anything that's even slightly negative about adoptions. Well, would you rather be aborted? Yeah. Said to my face by a stranger, you know, Um, and the one, it was very interesting to me because always growing up as an adoptee, as soon as people found out that we were adopting, because we told a lot of people, because we didn't want it to then be a shock and they say weird stuff around our child. We wanted Uh, it to be like, get it out now, people that are, you know, know us, whatever. But I got so many people. And there, in fact, there was a teacher multiple times from the daycare who would like stop me. Oh, thank you so much. And she's going to be so lucky. And I had to educate every time. And that one, because that was important. She was an educator. Yeah, that's going to interact with your kids. Yeah. Yeah. Other ones, I was like, oh, I'm just going to leave this be. But I was having some sleepless nights thinking, how do I, just this one individual, it's so many people, it's so pervasive. It's like, it's just, it's everywhere. And they just say the wrong things, like the most offensive things. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about how much transgender and stuff had, like they've done such a great job. Like Mm -hmm. we now all say like, what are your preferred pronouns? Like, yeah, we're getting it. That's amazing. I was like, how do we do that? And I just thought the only way I can is through children and through children's literature. Yeah. And I thought I can help educate the kids because I know Beth, I've said this to you before, but to all the adoptive parents listening, this might be the first time you hear this and this might shock you, but let it sit with you. The responsibility 
of educating your children's friends is 100% on your adoptee. Mm. That's right. Let that sit with you. I have educated every person in my life Mm. until getting this community, Beth, that we have, right? Yeah. But I have had, like, as a child, educate teachers, educate Mm. parents of my friends. Sure. It's a lot. And you just take it on. And your parents have no idea how much burden is on your shoulders to do that. Yeah. And some adoptees are ready for it. Some are done doing it. Yeah. Some are not ready for it. And so I wanted to, again, just being one person out there in this world, take a little bit of that burden away. Yeah. So my thought would be with this book, buy a whole bunch of like paperbacks, right? <laughs> You just have them uh-huh. laying around, uh-huh. hand them out. Like whenever your kid starts a new grade, give it to that teacher, right? Mm-hmm. Pass them out like candy. It is so important to educate outside of our adoption bubble. Yes. But here's the problem. They are not reading adoptee memoirs, right? They are not going out of their way to search this information because they think they right. know about it. Right. And I will tell you, I did a panel when I had created this book because I wanted to hear from people because how do you advertise a book that people don't know they need to ask for? Mm. And one gal joined who is a neighbor of a couple who's about to adopt and she has young Mm -hmm. kids. And she said, well, here's what happened. I thought, oh, I'm going to have this big conversation with my kids. Mm -hmm. And she's like, hey, they are adopting. So they are going to be having a baby soon, but you won't see, you know, her belly get big because the baby's not growing her belly. And then she froze and didn't know what else to say. And then they were asking her questions. And she's like, uh, uh, Um, and I I don't know, right? And so I thought about, and I thought about how does this go, right? How does this friend, because when you're young, you learn stuff about your friends and you're like so excited. Like this is something different. I've never heard of this. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? You come home to the dining room table Uh and you're like telling your family at dinner, right? So I have this little boy be the narrator and he comes home to dinner and he's so excited. And he's like, Hey, my friend, she's just like you and me. She likes to build rocket ships, dance, play dress up. But I learned today that she's adopted and I'm not saying this word for word. And so I didn't know what that meant. So I asked her to tell me her story. Okay. Then it launches into a bit of a flashback and it's questions and answers that little kids always ask adoptees. Oh gosh. And then how this very confident adoptee is answering these questions very simplistically to where he can understand it. So, you know, she's explaining about her birth mom. She's explaining about her parents. And he says, so you have two moms? And she says, yes, but more than that, I have two families. Ah, nice. Right? And then she explains, I have grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins on both sides. I stay in touch with them. And then he's bewildered and he scratches (laughs) his head. And he's like, do you love both of your families? And this is where, to me, it was very important There are certain things I do intentionally throughout these books, and this is to normalize this Mm -hmm. so that when they know that's kind of a strange question without making them feel like embarrassed or something, she giggles. She giggles. It's like, like, kind of like, that's kind of silly. You know, she giggles. Uh uh Yes, of course. I love them both. Mm. Just like you love your family. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And so this just helps give some answers to some questions that kids would have all in a kid-friendly tone, kid-friendly conversation. And what happens at the very end? They go back to playing. Yeah. They go back to playing. The story's over. And and his family is like, oh, thank you for telling us. You have such a special friend. Nice. Oh, that's so beautiful. Such a necessary book. And I don't know. I know I thought of that before, but I'm glad you did. 
So important. So I will list those links to get your book. Do you have a website you want to let us know about too? Or is it best just to go on Amazon or something? Yeah, you can go on Amazon. We also have redirect links from the website, ouradoptionbooks.com. And I post blogs in there too, where since I've gone through and read so many children's books, I have, I have basically my list of kind of this adoptee, Alison Olson's approved children's books. And then if okay. you, ch- children's adoption books specifically, But then I have another blog in there that if you only want to read adoptee written children's adoption books, I have the list in there as well. Oh, adoptee children. Mm -hmm. Ah, nice. Well, that's a great resource for anyone. And, you know, listeners, you might be thinking, I don't have a kid. Oh, well, you know someone that does, or you know a teacher, or you know a Sunday school teacher, or you know a pediatrician that should know about this, or you know a family in your neighborhood, and we need to get these books into people's hands so our adopted kids can be more supported. I think what you're doing is amazing. It's been great getting to know you. Thank you so much for being on. Thank you for having me. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you everyone for listening. Make sure and check out Allison's offerings at her website, which I will put in the show notes below. And while you're on the internet, go check out unravelingadoption.com where you'll find all sorts of things about our events, our podcast episodes, and our book called Adoption and Suicidality. And mark your calendars for an event in Southern California on February 8th, 2025. It'll be an all day healing event for the Adoption Constellation. Mark your calendar if SoCal is even a remote possibility for you, February 8th, 2025. Please share this episode so we get this information to more people and get Allison's books in more people's hands. Thank you again for listening. As always, Allison and I want you all to stay Stay safe. safe.